Good morning, this is Madeline. And this is Sue. And we're reading the County Press News for Friday the 14th of September. First of all, starting with the Society News. On Tuesday, Laura will be attending the Our Place drop-in session, which is held at the West White Sports and Community Centre in Mower Place, Freshwater, between 10am and 12 noon. And that's on Tuesday the 18th of September. She will have information about the society, the clubs and activities available, as well as demonstrations of some low vision aids available. Come along and say hello and enjoy a free tea or coffee. The Ride Swimming Group are meeting on Tuesday in Ride at the Waterside Pool. The pool is close to the public whilst the group swims. There are male and female volunteers to help you get in and out of the pool, as well as lifeguards to ensure your safety. To join the swimming group, please call the Society first to notify us of your swimming ability. We'll be holding a Low Vision Open Day on Wednesday the 19th of September at Millbrook House from 10 until 3pm. We'll be joined by Professional Vision Services and Dolphin. Our resource room will also be open with a range of low vision aids available, both new and pre-owned. Parking and refreshments are available. The weekly coffee morning will be held at Millbrook House this Wednesday on the 19th of September from 10.30am. The coffee mornings are not just for blind and partially sighted people. Anybody can come along and have a cup of coffee or tea as well as a piece of cake. The Wednesday social group will be meeting on Wednesday the 19th at 2 o'clock in Millbrook House. The entertainment this week is Just Sing, a musical singing group. The group lasts approximately 45 minutes, which is then followed by tea or coffee and cake. The Thursday Social Group are meeting on Thursday the 20th of September at Millbrook House. The group meets from 10.30 till 2 o'clock. You can knit or just have a chat. And then later in the afternoon, volunteers come in and read to the group from different topics. Keen walkers are invited to contact the Society if they're available regularly to support our visually impaired walking group as a sighted guide. The group gets together on the second Tuesday of every month for a short pre-planned walk. They meet at a coffee venue before heading off for a different walk each month. There's the choice of joining the group for lunch at a pre-planned venue after the walk. For further information about joining as a volunteer, please call 522205 or email volunteers at iwsb.org.uk. Sight for White will be fundraising by way of a bucket collection on the morning of Saturday the 15th of September tomorrow at the Co-op in Freshwater between 10 and 1 o'clock. We hope to see you there if you're shopping locally. We invite members to join us at the Key Arts Centre Newport on Wednesday the 26th of September between 5pm and 7pm for drinks and nibbles. Please RSVP on 52205 or email members at iwsb.org.uk. The Key Arts Centre also holds a weekly quiz that evening from 7pm should anyone wish to stay on and take part. Teams of four at £5 each to include a vegetarian curry. Call the Key Arts Direct on 822490 to book your table. Do you have retinitis pigmentosa, or RP, or inherited sight loss? If you or anyone you know has a condition called retinitis pigmentosa, or inherited sight loss, there is a group that meets the second Monday of every month at Landguard Manor, Shanklin, from 11am to 1pm. You can find out about the latest research news, source information and support and also meet with others with the same condition going through the same problems. Refreshments are available. For more information please contact Colin MacArthur 
on 07935 747 332. So now on to the scaffolding news. Please find below a list of known footway obstructions for work, including scaffolding or hoarding. And we're unable to include end dates as many are extended on a week by week basis. And also included are tables and chairs permits that have been issued in the past week. Bay and Ventnor area. There's currently scaffolding at Premier Inn 1 to 9 Esplanade Sandown. 11A and 11B St John's Road Sandown, the Toy Master 103 High Street Sandown, and the Scaffold Up in Albion Road, the Castle Pub 12 to 14 Fitzroy Street Sandown, 36 Melville Street Sandown, Sandown Library 119 High Street Sandown, corner of Trinity Road and Madeira Road Ventnor, Boniface Road and into Trinity Road Ventnor. 2 Eleanor House, Grove Road, Ventnor, Clive Barber's Jewellers, High Street, Ventnor. And new scaffolding is due up at Ivy Bank, Marlborough Road, Ventnor from the 1st of October. And there are currently hoardings at the Premier Inn, 1 to 9 Esplanade, Sandown, and skips at 40 Albert Street, Ventnor. In the Cows area, there is currently scaffolding at 93 High Street Cows behind Hoarding, Sainsbury's 129 to 130 High Street Cows, 12 Union Street Cows, 63 St Mary's Road Cows, Cows Library, Beckford Road Cows, also up in West Hill Road. There are currently hoardings at 93 High Street Cows and there are currently skips at 5 Gordon Road Cows and there is currently a crane at Osborne Court, the Parade Cows. In the Newport area, there's currently scaffolding at 18 Crocker Street, Newport, White Grill, 144 High Street, Newport, Jusons, Trafalgar Road, Newport, Santander, 26 St James Street, Newport, and there's scaffold up round the corner in Pyle Street. 117 St James Street, Newport, which is also up in Lugley Street. Key Cottage, 12 Key Street, Newport. 34 Albert Street, Newport. And new scaffolding is due at 2 to 8 Carisbrook Road, Newport, from the 4th of October. 6 Lugley Street, Newport, from the 24th of September. And there's a skip at 89 White Pit Lane, Newport. And a new skip is due at 68 Medina Avenue, Newport. In the ride area, there is currently scaffolding at My Dentist 10 to 11 Cross Street Ride, Boots 170 High Street Ride, Hills Court High Street and Newport Street Ride, Red Cross Shop High Street Ride, 12 George Street Ride, 18 George Street Ride and 73 George Street Ride, Watson Bull and Porter 9 High Street Ride, 12A High Street Ride, 91 High Street Ride. There are currently skips at 33 High Street Bembridge 32 Foreland Road, Bembridge, 24 Swanmore Road, Ride, Walden, Nettleston Hill, Seaview, Riding Light, Nettleston Green, Seaview, Blewett's Cottage, Blewett Avenue, Seaview. In the West White area, there's currently scaffolding at Jojo's, School Green Road, Freshwater, and Broadway Garage, the Broadway Totland. For this week's In Touch. In Touch in this week's episode. School closure, the parents view and how to wow an audience with your public speaking. Last week the Royal National Institute for the Blind announced the closure of the Pairs Centre, a children's home and school run by the charity. 
The Pears Centre was shut in November after Ofsted, Ofsted raised significant concerns about the management of the Specialist Learning Centre. The children at the centre will need to find new placements. We get reaction from Hardeep Rai, a parent whose son is a resident at the Pears Centre in Coventry. And we'll find out how best to wow the audience if you're doing public speaking. We'll report from a new course being run by Blind Veterans UK, designed to help servicemen who do speeches and presentations, both to help in the jobs market and to act as ambassadors for the organisation. Learn more about how to engage an audience and how to make the most of your body language. And the presenter is Peter White and the producer is Jess Quayle. So now on to the County Press, uh, the headline for today. Cheaper for some. Cut price ferries offer for poorer island residents. News of cut price ferry fares for islanders on low incomes has been met with a mixed reaction. While many are pleased 14,000 residents will be eligible, others have said the discounts do not do enough to help everyone. Islanders receiving housing benefit or council tax support will qualify and more than 80 people have already sent applications to the Isle of Wight Council. The scheme is being funded by the ferry companies. Angry residents took to social media to express their frustrations over the scheme. Commenting on the County Press website, Mikhail Kovlowski said... It is good that people struggling to survive on low incomes are given this discount, but it is merely a sticking plaster for the real problem of excessive and variable fares just to get to the mainland. It's not just those on benefits who struggle to afford the ferry company's eye-watering fares. John Mack added, Why can't everyone just get it cheap? With how extortionate the prices are, even on a modest wage, I struggle to justify it. Council leader, Councillor Dave Stewart, said he had not lost sight of the problems faced by islanders. He said, It's a good thing we can get down the cost of travelling for some people. However, there are more people out there in the mid-range who say, What about us? The challenge has not gone away and we support island MP Bob Seeley in his call for a public service obligation and fair affairs for islanders. Mr Seeley welcomed the announcement but said it did not do enough to address the broader issues of an island duopoly. He said it goes some way to address issues of affordability for those who at present find it a struggle to afford to use the ferries. Island Labour Chair Julian Critchley said the policy only addressed the symptoms rather than curing the problem. Parliamentary candidate for the Isle of Wight Green Party, Vix Lothian, said the outrage was predictable. She said, It is a reminder of how utterly unaffordable ferry tickets are for the low-wage earners, which make up the majority of those of us who live here. Also commenting on the County Press website, Janie Keedy Ingham Jackson said, I'm one who is on benefits. I don't choose to be ill, so it's helpful for me with hospital appointments and everything. But I also agree 100% that all islanders should get more of a discount. Joe Wright agreed. As someone who receives the listed benefits, this will be a great help. But my first thought on reading this is, why is it not for everyone? But David Watts said, another kick between the legs for islanders who work hard for a living... If our representatives were in touch, they would realise the average Isle of Wight wage is low. And how to claim your Isle of Wight ferry discount. The County Press interviewed the leader of the Isle of Wight Council, Councillor Dave Stewart, this week to find out more about the discounted ferry fare scheme. Not only did we want to know who was going to pay for the scheme and administer it, but also what discounts residents could expect to receive. Who is going to pay for the scheme? 
The ferry companies are leading the discount. There are no costs to the council other than administrative costs. The council is dealing with the initial applications, however. The scheme is mainly administered by the ferry companies. The council has not funded it in any way and no money is being spent on extra resources to deal with the applications. When someone applies for the discount, the application is sent to the ferry company who check it with the council if the person named is eligible. Who is going to administer the scheme? The ferry companies are leading the administration of the scheme. The team which deals with housing benefit will be checking applications, but no extra resources will be put in to help with the initial flood of applications. How, to, how do you apply? Through the relevant ferry companies, your application is then sent to the council who assess it, and if you are eligible for the discount, a code will automatically will be automatically applied to your account every time you travel. Is there a limit on how many times you can travel? There is no limit and the discount is applied every time, but the scheme will be reviewed by the ferry companies themselves and it's not clear yet if it's going to be a set time for the scheme in general. When it comes round to the end of the financial year and the people are reassessed for benefits, this may change whether they are eligible. Applications must be made to the council seven days before travelling to allow processing time. What discounts are available? Whitelink. Those who qualify will be able to pay the price of multi-link crossings around £27 each way, without having to pay the upfront cost of a booklet of 10. Red Funnel. Those who qualify will be able to get a £48 ferry return or 20% off the lowest standard web fare if this is cheaper, so the maximum amount paid will be £48. For foot passengers, Hover Travel is offering a £12 return and Red Funnel a £10 return. The Red Jet is not part of the scheme. All discounts are subject to availability. Which benefits qualify? You need to be a resident on the island claiming local council tax support or housing benefit. You do not have to be the driver of the vehicle for the discount to be valid. You'll need a letter of benefit entitlement or a council tax bill, as well as a photo ID if claiming in person at Hover Travel. Plans for the island's first water park at Robin Hill. Plans have been unveiled for a multi-million pound water park at Robin Hill, featuring indoor and outdoor pools, a wave machine, flumes and rapids. Vectis Ventures said a planning application for the Springs, supported by an environmental impact statement, would be submitted to the Isle of Wight Council later this month. Managing Director Alec DeBell said the project, which had been years in the making, would create jobs and benefit tourism. At the end of October every year, we have to say farewell to so many young people and that really grates, he said. This will provide not just jobs all year round, but career paths and opportunities. The Springs is designed to extend the tourism season. The island needs more innovative, fun, all-weather attractions for visitors and residents in the autumn and winter months. Visit Isle of Wight Managing Director Will Miles said, The Springs is exactly what we need on the island for residents and visitors alike. We are always looking for ways to extend our overall season, and this will certainly have a huge impact. Construction should start within two years, subject to planning approval, and the build itself will take about 18 months. The springs will be built at Robin Hill's northern boundary, next to the nesting development of a treehouse accommodation, lodges and ecopods already approved by planners. The development will measure 3,100 square metres and the building will be between 13 and 15 metres tall with a grass roof to blend in with the surroundings. 
It will be a separate attraction, so visitors will not have to buy a ticket to Robin Hill to visit the water park. Mr DeBell said, The spring's development will complement our plans for nesting, creating a fantastic reason to visit the Isle of Wight. We are extremely excited to progress with these plans. The springs will be splashing great fun. Kessia's Memorial Garden to open soon in East Cowes. A memorial garden to Kessia Flux Edmonds is about to open. The garden, which opens on Monday, October the 1st at 11am, features play equipment, trees and a bench carved by Eccleston George. An arch with handprints of Year 4 children in Kezia's class was created by The Forge. Kezia's mum, Nikki, said, I want those who helped raise the money know it was worth it. I'm excited because it's in my daughter's name and I love her being remembered. I'm nervous because I want to represent her well. Most of all, I'm grateful and look forward to knowing children, our most precious resource, will be having fun. Over £13,000 has been raised for the garden, which sits on Beatrice Avenue, opposite Queensgate School. A tree has been donated by Dixie's, as well as an etching of Kezia's favourite dog toy. Nikki said, we also have a little girl coming to sing Roar by Katy Perry for the opening. Randini will help with the opening as he was Kezia's favourite entertainer. I'm so grateful for the island's love and support. Kezia Six died tragically in 2016. Bank closure, protests invited. Freshwater Parish Council has invited people to protest against the closure of Lloyd's Bank in the village in January. The bank is currently open three days a week and Lloyd's claims the decision has been taken due to the changing ways customers are banking. It is the last bank open in the West White and will be replaced with a mobile banking service, full details of which have yet to be confirmed. Freshwater Parish Clerk Michael Mills said... I have been contacted by members of the public who think nothing can be done. One said a lot of people are very upset by the closure and I did suggest that it would be helpful if they wrote in to the parish. We will put this on the October agenda to discuss how best to take it forward. Resident Ian Frisk said, If our last bank goes, then the village and our businesses will die. The local shops will need a bank to put in their takings and get coinage. Now their time will be taken up going into Newport. It's another nail in the coffin for fresh water. Summer feel-good factor good for the Isle of Wight economy. The temperature was up, the pound was down and staycations were the newest in holiday. The Isle of Wight had a bumper summer season. After the BBC revealed this was the hottest English summer on record, Businesses, ferry companies and attractions have spoken of the sunshine feel-good factor that saw numbers rise, sales soar and provided the island with a wholesome holiday feel. Will Miles, Managing Director of Visit Isle of Wight said, Ferry companies and hotels I've been speaking to reported an upsurge in business, some of which was down to the glorious weather. Red Funnels Marketing Director Jonathan Green said the firm has seen an increase in day trip and staying visits since the start of the good weather in June and Hover Travel reported a boom in sales, particularly for events such as Pride and the Isle of Wight Festival. A White Link spokesperson said it had been carrying significantly more customers compared to 2017. Chief Executive Keith Greenfield said, More British people are choosing staycations this year and we are also seeing more foreign visitors on our ferries and fast cats. It's all great news for the island. Marketing manager at the Needles Landmark attraction, Rachel Hardiman, said she had noticed an increase in footfall through Allen Bay. She added, there's also a massive increase in overseas visitors, 
mainly Asian and European, who are making educational trips and enjoying the walks and cycle paths. I definitely think the good weather has helped with that too. Not many people want to walk or cycle in the rain. It's just not large companies and tourist attractions that felt the benefits of the heat. Owner of Plaza Isis, Gary Hall said, There's no doubt it's been a bumper season. Last year, we lost three days of Cow's Week exposure due to the bad weather. The last couple of months have been super for business and super for the island. Tracy Long, co-owner of Cow's-based boutique shops Live Like This and Buff, said, The feel-good factor the sunshine brings translates directly to fantastic sales. The prolonged good weather means people are doing a bit of shopping and a bit of beach action. Our sales have been brilliant. Lucky no one was hurt. The maintenance of Red Funnel's fire extinguishing system has been branded inadequate after a potentially fatal accident. Leaking cylinder valves have been blamed for the incident on the Red Eagle when carbon dioxide gas was accidentally released during a crossing from the Isle of Wight to Southampton. Shortly after the 4.20am sailing left East Cowes on July the 17th last year, the carbon dioxide release alarm sounded in the engine room. The chief engineer checked the room and heard a loud hissing sound. Opening the door slightly, he could see a dense white cloud of gas. The crew agreed no emergency response was necessary other than to ensure no one entered the carbon dioxide room or the engine room and the car ferry was taken out of service until the system could be inspected. Of the system's 26 carbon dioxide cylinders, it transpired all but the two master cylinders had either fully or partially discharged due to one or more leaking valves. The Red Eagle was out of service until July the 21st, while the valves were replaced. Following an investigation, the Marine Accident Investigation Branch, MAIB, found significant deficiencies in the inspection and maintenance of the fire extinguishing system by service suppliers, not actually by Redfull itself. The valves had been refurbished, despite the manufacturer's instructions to the contrary, which led to brass particles being becoming trapped on the seal of one valve, causing it to leak. The MAIB's report concluded it was lucky no one was hurt. It said, The concentration of carbon dioxide required to extinguish the fire is more than double that required to kill a human being in a minute. The unintended release of carbon dioxide from fire extinguishing systems has caused 72 deaths and 145 injuries, mainly in the marine industry, between 1975 and 2000. The current fit-it-and-forget-it approach to cylinder valves is unsafe. Regular inspection and maintenance, in line with the manufacturer's instructions, is of paramount importance. The MAIB found guidance on the maintenance and inspection of carbon dioxide fire extinguishing systems was insufficient. Red Funnel was advised to review the design of carbon dioxide systems where the leak of a single cylinder valve causes the entire system to discharge. Sheep worrying in Knighton. Another farmer has urged people to keep their dogs under control after another case of sheep worrying. Andrew Hodgson of Cheverton Farm Shorewell keeps some of his flock at Knighton Manor Farm on St Catherine's Down, Knighton. He was alerted by a neighbouring farmer the sheep were being chased by a dog. It took Mr Hodgson 15 minutes to get to them, by which time the dog and its walker had gone, but the 275 sheep were huddled together in a tight group, breathing heavily and displaying very stressed behaviour. Two had been nipped on the neck and were bleeding. This followed an incident last week when more than 25 sheep died near Merston after a suspected dog attack. Mr Hodgson said, I was lucky not to find any dead sheep, but they had most definitely been chased. The field has a walking trail through, running through it and is just below the pepper pot, so it is a popular footpath and well trodden. 
I am not trying to stop people walking on my land. I do not mind people walking through, and it seems a shame to have dogs on a lead on downland, so I am not demanding dogs are kept on a lead. I just think the two things can happen at the same time, sheep in a field and people walking with dogs, as long as the dogs are kept under control. People should know their dogs and their behaviour. I have signs up either at the ends of the field asking for dogs to be kept under control. My number is on the signs. If dogs do chase the sheep, I would rather, for the sheep's sake, be told. Pub closes its doors, for now. An award-winning Isle of Wight pub has closed its doors, temporarily. New Inn, Shalfleet, publicans Kate and Dan, who do not wish to give their full names, have said they are heartbroken at their decision. They took over the business in January 2017, but Kate said, It's a very difficult time. We have, unfortunately, and to our great sadness, had no choice but to close the doors for now. It was certainly not a decision that was taken lightly, or with the options available to us. And we are utterly heartbroken. The plans and dreams we had for the pub and our future, with it, have come to this. The difficulties of the industry and the financial struggles of the landlords, particularly of leasehold, tied tenancy pubs belonging to large companies, are sadly all too familiar to the island community, and unfortunately, we were not immune. We want to extend our sincere thanks and appreciation to our customers and supporters, particularly our wonderful locals who have been so kind to us and many of whom have become friends. We cannot comment on when the pub will be reopened, as that is now in the hands of Enterprise Inns, but we sincerely hope the pub will reopen soon. A spokesman from Enterprise Inns Publican Partnerships said, We are currently in contact with the publican at the new Inn Shell Fleet and would like to reassure the local community that we aim to reopen the pub as soon as possible. Zone would hurt economy. A proposed £100 a day chargeable clean air zone in Southampton has been slammed by the leader of the Isle of Wight Council amid fears it could hit the island's economy and threaten jobs. Councillor Dave Stewart has spoken out against Southampton City Council's plans to charge commercial vehicles which do not meet emission standards entering parts of the city. He said it was unacceptable there had been no impact assessment for the Isle of Wight, even though it would be detrimental to our economy. The City Council continues to stand by the charge, which it and environmental campaigners say will improve the quality of life for residents in the city. Calling for an exemption for vehicles heading from or to the Isle of Wight, Councillor Stewart said, Island residents and businesses are reliant on the transportation of goods and undertaking of services by bus, coach, private hire vehicles and particularly heavy goods vehicles through Southampton, many of which are diesel powered. Figures show more than 100 HGV vehicles per day use the Southampton East Cows Red Funnel route, which will be in the Clean Air Zone, or CAZ. Coach operators based on and off the island bring more than a 1,000 coach journeys via Southampton during the summer months, in addition to the regular year-round traffic that gives much-needed revenue to our tourism sector out of season. The fact, the fact there could be a possible charge of £100 a day by 2019 for vehicles that do not meet emission standards without co consideration for the island and its, new, sorry, its unique position is unacceptable and will harm our tourism and manufacturing industries and potentially cost jobs. For example, Coach operators' business models will be seriously impacted by a charge of £100 and the island runs the risk they will not visit. He added, everyone wants to have cleaner air and this council is supportive and committed to helping the environment. However, 
The impact on the island and the potential for the jobs to be threatened by CAZ over the Solent has not been has not been fully recognised and is very real. The council wants traffic identified as entering the CAZ and which is making an onward journey to and from the Isle of Wight made exempt from the charging regime for a substantial period so operators and owners can update their fleets and eventually comply with the CAZ. As leader, I cannot stand by and see other authorities and agencies make decisions that are detrimental to this island's residences, residents and businesses. Experts warn more than 100 deaths a year in Southampton are attributed to long-term exposure to air pollution. Southampton City Council leader Chris Hammond has said the charge for commercial vehicles that aren't Euro 6 compliant, like London's congestion zone, was needed. He said, if measures come forward that can achieve the same outcome as a charging zone, then we would look into them. However, we have been told by the government we must use a method that reaches the results in the quickest possible way, which this does. It is the right thing to do. Light goods vehicles such as vans and cars will be exempt from the charges. 13 years for man who preyed on girls. A man who sexually assaulted three underage girls has been jailed for more than 13 years. Richard Victor Gates, 49, of Horsebridge Hill, Newport, was sentenced at the Isle of Wight Crown Court last Friday. He had previously admitted five counts of sexually assaulting a girl under 13, ten counts of sexual activity with a girl under 16, and four counts of voyeurism. In victim impact statements read in court, Gates' victims, now young women, said his accusations had caused them a great... uh, Sorry, his actions had caused them a great deal of fear, pain and misery. One said... What he did was wrong, and no one should have to go through it. Sometimes I stay out late, thinking about it, remembering stuff. Some days I feel really down. I don't feel like getting up. Another said, I have struggled with anxiety. I'm afraid of being alone. I'm sometimes scared to answer the front door. I get depressed and sleep a lot. Until I met my fiancé, I was scared of men. I got into relationships with people who who used or mistreated me. In mitigation, Berenice Mulvaney said Gates knew what he was doing was wrong, but he could not stop himself. He is genuinely remorseful and disgusted with himself. It was almost like an addiction, she said. He has lost his good character. He has lost everything. Gates was sentenced to 13 and a half years for the 19 offences. After serving half his sentence, he will be released on licence for the remaining half. He will remain on the sex offenders register for the rest of his life. Judge Timothy Moolesley said, You took gross advantage of three defenceless children. You effectively deprived them of their childhood and took away their innocence. They knew it was wrong, of course it was. No one should have to go through that. Each of them has had to struggle with what you did to them. I expect they will get some comfort from today, but the effect of them will not end. It will remain with them in one way or another for the rest of their lives. Singer's Carnegie Hall Honour An island choir will sing at one of the the world's most prestigious venues, Carnegie Hall in New York. Members of the Medina Community Choir will fly to the Big Apple next March to take part in a performance of composer John Rutter's Magnificat. The performance, featuring selected ensembles from around the world, has been organised by the Distinguished Concerts International New York City Production Company. The choir director, Hannah Brayer, said, Around 46 members will be going, just under half the choir, with the youngest being a Year 7 student from Medina College's Maestro programme and the oldest in their late 70s. 
It's a crazy achievement for a choir which started in 2011 with only six members and a dream to be asked to perform. DCINY Artistic Director and Principal Conductor Jonathan Griffith said, The Medina Community Choir received this invitation because of the quality and high level of musicianship demonstrated by the singers, as well as the exceptional quality of their audition recording. It is quite an honour just to be invited to perform in New York. These wonderful musicians not only represent a high quality of music and education, but they also become ambassadors for the entire community. This is an event of extreme pride for everybody and deserving of the community's recognition and support. The Isle of Wight singers will spend several days in the city rehearsing ahead of the performance on March the 17th. Community helps good deed boys. The people of Sandown chipped in to help two boys whose bags were stolen when they were alerting the emergency services to a fire. Josh Payne and Joel Preston, both 13, and pupils at the Bay CE School, Sandown, were presented with £400 to make up for their trainers and personal belongings being stolen. They'd been playing football with friends at Rainbow Park on Saturday when they put out a small fire, then phoned 999 when they discovered a bigger one. After helping to deal with the fires, they went to collect their bags, but they were no longer there. Josh's £110 white Adidas trainers had been stolen from his bag, and Joel's bag was stolen, along with the contents, including an iPhone 5S and £150 trainers. Hearing of their plight, Sandown Hub created a Just Giving page, which raised £400 within 24 hours. Josh's mother, Emma, said, Josh is overwhelmed by the kind kindness and generosity of everyone and is incredibly grateful. He was quite shaken and upset by it all, but I'm very proud of him. Joel's mother, Haley, said, We as parents are so grateful and very proud of our children for doing the right thing. Rubbish dumped at beauty spot. A shocking case of fly tipping happened in the West White on Friday. A member of the Isle of Wight Birding Facebook group, Gary Haddon, posted a photograph on their page. It shows rubbish dumped close to one of the island's beauty spots, Tennyson Monument, in the car park of West High Down, near the High Down Inn. A child's cot, boxes, plastic goods and toys are among the items left. Gary said there was also a letter with a name and address among the rubbish. And that's all we have time for today. So it's goodbye from Madeline. And it's goodbye from Sue. Good morning, I'm Lester. And I'm Linda. And we're starting with the reader's letters. And the first one is Alarm Bells and it's from Joe Hulse in Gurnard. The headline, Running on Luck, in the county press 070918, was well written and presented. It should ring alarm bells, no pun intended, in every island resident's head. The recent joint fires in Sandown have opened a window both on the present and possible future state of the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service. The report shows it is too understaffed to do its job. The article gives precise examples of this, yet our council wishes to make further cuts. Sadly, our representatives, who I suspect are decent people, are like all politicians. They are put into key posts where they have absolutely no experience, knowledge or understanding of the service they become responsible for. In their minds, they become accountants, and while thinking they know the cost of everything, they fail to understand the value of anything, and in so doing lose sight of the post they are holding. In the much-mentioned forthcoming review, who have they actually spoken to? Consultants, whose first question is invariably, what answer do you want? If they, the politicians, are going to make risk assessments, have they actually spoken to the frontline crew members who are employed to do the job and therefore have first-hand knowledge? 
surely that is where a good part of the answer will lie. These crews are good enough to put their lives on the line at every shout. Therefore, they must be good enough to give honest, sound advice to the politicians. Yes, Hampshire did respond to our request for assistance, but it should be remembered that, unlike a similar event on the mainland, for them to get here it's going to be at least an hour because it involves a ferry. That assumes one is available and has space. I wonder if that risk has been taken into account. And now from Nina Ogden of Knighton. I would like to share something rather lovely that happened when I went to the brilliant Wolverton Manor show with my friend and her new husband. We came upon a store for Newport steel and fabrication and my friend paused to look at a beautiful steel rose. My friend's mum died recently from cancer and as her middle name was Rose, I asked my friend if she wanted it to put on her mum's grave to which she nodded, yes. My friend is disabled and funds are tight and even though the rose was very reasonably priced, she couldn't afford it, so put it down. As we were walking away, someone came running up to us and handed my friend the rose saying the stall holder had overheard our conversation and wanted her to have the rose anyway. We were both moved to tears by this kindness and were once again reminded of how wonderful the people of this island are. Audit of bridge needed, and this is from Cameron Palin in East Cowes. There are dozens of design and engineering problems with this floating bridge the Isle of Wight Council appears to refuse to acknowledge, let alone address. There needs to be a completely independent engineering audit of the whole floating bridge to meet its true requirements and make it as good as, if not better, than floating bridge five. It doesn't need to be bigger. 45% fewer cars use a floating bridge compared with 10 years ago. It needs to be frequent and reliable and this design prevents this bridge from doing its job for the next 30 years. Also, as a floating bridge campaigner, I'm fed up of being called the problem when all I'm trying to provide is a voice for many members of the community who can't speak out. I am proud to publicly scrutinise this council's decision when all it has done is fail the community of cows and east cows. The council has tried to use a typical divide and conquer tactic to use the staff against campaigners and try not to make them believe we are against the staff. We are not. We feel great sympathy for the staff and believe they are doing a fantastic job in very difficult circumstances created with this bad floating bridge. The council needs to admit defeat, accept help and listen to our engineers and to the current and former bridge staff who have been ignored consistently. Considering the, the more than a million pounds of taxpayers' money so far the Council has wasted on unsuccessful attempts to fix some of the problems, sometimes, like in this instance, the cheaper and better option is to start over with a design more similar to Floating Bridge 5. The Council's Floating Bridge statistics are all spin. I believe the Council has acted unprofessionally and incompetently, which is why I'm not surprised people do not have faith in and do not trust our Council. This is from Councillor Tig Outlaw, Member for Lake North, Cabinet Member for Community Safety and Public Protection in Lake. Anyone who has been reading the county press this past month could be forgiven for thinking our streets are too unsafe to leave home, but staying at home could be equally dangerous. I don't make light of genuine concern for the resilience of our emergency services, but sensationalist headlines can portray the island in a very negative light. It's unfair to create such an image given the hard work and professionalism of our police firefighters, ambulance staff and council officers who work tirelessly to keep our communities safe. Clearly, protect, predicting when and where a crime will be committed or where a fire may break out is impossible 
and risk can't be eliminated. Our emergency services must work to ensure the greater resources available when the risk is greatest. To be clear, and to avoid being misquoted, the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service Review is designed to match available resources to risk. We know the risk of fire is greatest during the day, with Sunday historically being the busiest day. Had the service review passed through council in the spring, we would have seen more whole-time firefighters and more appliances available at the time of the Sandown Hotel fire. We face a challenge recruiting on-call firefighters. They are rightly proud of the job they do in keeping their communities safe. We can all help support recruitment. To that end, the Isle of Wight Council has in recent weeks changed its policy to allow staff to become on-call firefighters for the first time in years. And I would ask all island employers to do the same. We all want the same thing, a safe island community. Now, editor's footnote. Both fire and police spokesmen outlined to the county press their fears for the safety of islanders. It wasn't the county press making things up for so-called sensationalist headlines. Intimidation. From Councillor Jackie Merriweather in Sandown. I refer to the fiasco of an attempted meeting of the Sandown Town Council on September the 5th. As Mayor, I presided over the meeting and called for any questions relating to the matters on the agenda from the public. As some of the questions did not relate to the agenda, I asked the member of the public not to continue. Unsubstantiated allegations against me personally and my family were then made during the public outcry. As I could not quieten the public, I closed the meeting in accordance with my power as chairman. The only remaining item on the agenda was deferred to another time. The clerk and other members of the council left the meeting. I am sorry an elected Isle of Wight councillor has not read the fundamental rules we have to work to and she chose to disrupt the meeting too. The clerk wished to lock up the building and set the alarm and, as the meeting would not disperse, the police were called. The crowd did not disperse from the car park until much later and the CCTV shows this. The alleged good humour was not present when I left the building as I had to walk through a rowdy crowd. I am horrified a paid employee of the council, the clerk, also had to suffer this intimidation. This is an undemocratic, sustained campaign by a minority group and I and other councillors should not be made to feel intimidated. I'm hurt and offended that after almost 20 years of working for this town, I should be bullied by this group and my integrity called into question. I will address town council issues through the proper channels, not via social media, but when my family is called into question, I can see I shall have to get solicitor's advice. John Farthing of Newport writes, Matthew Chatfield, in my view, the County Press of the 7th of September, highlighted a very serious issue, the insidious abdication by successive governments of both persuasions of their responsibility in the maintenance of publicly owned properties, one of the prime responsibilities of governments and councils. When the country was properly run, this was the responsibility of a government department known as the Ministry of Public Buildings and Works, which tends to be conveniently forgotten. The formation of English heritage, we were expected to believe, was just a modernistic name change. Far from it. It was just a devious way of gradually avoiding responsibility. Mr Chatfield has ably explained there is likely to be a huge shortfall in funding, leaving English heritage presiding over the ruination of the government's properties. The government should take back control and its responsibilities. Build Bridge, 
This is from Mr. A. E. Thurl in Newport. With reference to the proposed new traffic system at St. Mary's, any advantage is offset by adding more problems to the Coppins Bridge setup. The money for this project will be far better spent on a bridge over the Medina. With prospect of more houses being built in the Cows area, with at least one extra car per household, this means even more cars at St Mary's and Coppins Bridge. Further to my letter last year in the County Press 2710-17, my suggested bridge would ease the traffic problem considerably. It would also be an asset for when the Cows Floating Bridge is out of service due to the low tides. Another asset would be cars using far less fuel, so less fumes. Ferry traffic via East Cows and Fishbourne would also be expedited. From Bob Seeley, RNP. When I wrote to the Secretary of State for Transport to demand answers about the sale of Whitelink, I did so because it was in the interest of islanders. I wanted to register my concern the ferries companies that ferry companies are bought and sold without regard to our interests, despite the two main firms running a near monopoly. I did this to make sure any future owners understand the need to improve White Link's relationship with islanders and to be more supportive of the island's agenda. I am sure everyone who works for White Link would echo that call. Every islander without a political axe to grind, with whom I have spoken, supports my call for the ferries to be more responsive to the needs of the island and to offer a better deal for the island. Let me make my own agenda very clear. I was elected to fight for the island and to speak for it. That's what I am doing. And the final letter for this week, Carnival Float from Sue and Terry Harlow in Ride. We just wish to say how wonderful all the carnival processions in Ride were last week. The weather was especially kind for everyone. Many thanks to all the people who worked very hard throughout the year to make the event possible. Also, can we put in a request for someone to provide a covered area for the Ride Queen's Float so it can be built and prepared for the carnivals in all the towns on the island, as the float currently has to be left out in the elements all year long. Surely the town of Ride deserves to have a special float as it was the first carnival in England 130 years ago. And now an ode to our floaty. Excuse my exposition here. Bridge number six still has no name. No one wants you. That's a shame. It's not your fault. You didn't know. The river has a tidal flow. You're much too heavy, long and wide, as you cross from side to side. Will you come? Will you go? It all depends on the tidal flow. You also make an appalling sound. And I've heard you run aground as you clang from east to west. We all know you do your best. You didn't know the tide was strong and that your chains are much too long. The council says the work's in hand. Things haven't gone quite as they planned. So in steps Dave, the man in charge, has cunning plan. We'll get a barge. Bargy McBarge face saves the day, stops our floaty from going astray. It's not your fault, don't worry mate, the council will decide your fate. So dear floaty, if all else fails, just hoist your chains, go home to Wales. Bargy McBarge face big and strong, saw immediately what was wrong. He steps in and saves the day, stops our floaty going astray. Leave it all to Dave, our man. He surely has another plan. Maybe he'll share it with us all, with kind permission from County Hall. And uh, now we move on to looking back, starting with a hundred years ago, on September the 14th, 1918. 
The chairman of Newport Town Council's Sanitary Committee reported the man in charge of the sewage disposal works had met with a serious accident by falling into a sludge tank and being overcome by gas. Although he was retrieved quickly by colleagues, his arm was injured and poisoning set in, leaving him seriously ill. At the age of 76, he said he had no wish to return to his duties on his recovery. And the second item, the Admiralty suggested a section of Cowes Harbour should be dredged to stop the floating bridge getting stuck. Two mud banks above and below the floating bridge, on one of which the bridge got stuck earlier in the week, should be removed, it was said. Serious inconvenience would have been caused if Messrs J.S. White and co. had not come to the rescue with their motorboats. Now, 75 years ago, September the 11th, 1943. Tightening a mop up of bylaws which required ferry passengers to produce their tickets on embarkation caused consternation with some regular travel travellers who said the staff knew they already had tickets so they didn't need to show them. One man appeared at the county petty sessions for refusing to show his ticket on the cows to East Cows floating bridge despite having a period ticket. The defendant was fined two pounds and told he had caused a lot of unnecessary trouble. And West White residents campaigned to preserve Farringdon House as a national memorial to Tennyson. There had been rumours the estate would fall into the hands of builders, which would have been a tragedy, as it had been preserved by the trustees of Tennyson's estate almost exactly as it was when occupied by the poet. Fifty years ago, on September the 7th, 1968, Apprehension about the Great South Coast Bank Holiday Pop Festival, as the organiser styled it, proved unnecessary. The event held at Hellfield Ford Farm, Godshill, throughout Saturday night, passed off almost without incident. An estimated 9,000 fans made their way to the remote field. The only damage of note was caused by fans who wandered through a field of barley belonging to the Holden Farm, Rude, and caused up to £40 worth of damage. And the second item from um, 50 years ago. Plessy Radar was breaking into the marine radar market with a set specifically designed for the American private boat owner. The MR-12 had been developed and tested for two years and would be introduced at the New York Boat Show in January. And 25 years ago, September the 10th, 1993, a Bond Church cottage was sold to an advertising executive who saw it advertised while he was 7,000 miles away in Hong Kong. He purchased <coughs> Granged Cottage for £84,000 without visiting it. Once he did get to his new home, he reported he was very pleased with his acquisition. Also from that date, Ventnor Town Council took control of the Ventnor Winter Gardens, which had been threatened with closure. Plans were put in place to turn the venue into a full community centre, with local amateur dramatic groups encouraged to hire the theatre for performances. A decision was also expected to be made on the future of Sandown Pavilion and Shanklin Theatre, which were advertised together for joint management tenders. And finally, 10 years ago, September the 12th, 2008, the Isle of Wight County Press announced it was switching to tabloid format after 124 years as a broadsheet. Research found that 87% of readers wanted a smaller format instead of having to spread the paper out on the floor or across the dining table. And a massive clean-up operation begun at Robin Hill after 30,000 festival goers descended on the site in horrendous weather conditions and much of the 87-acre site was reduced to mud. Not everyone was unhappy about the conditions as shops across the island sold out of Wellington boots. 
The festival was headlined by My Bloody Valentine, Amy Winehouse and The Underworld, with a special appearance by Grace Jones. And now in White Memories, an article entitled Willie, King of the Selfies. This is illustrated by some very old photographs. Could these be the first selfies ever taken? These rare self-portraits of St Helens photographer Albert William Willie Wade were given to St Helens Historical Society by Fred Henry of Brading. Taken in 1911, one of the pictures is attached to a postcard on which the photographer explained how he took the picture. Willie Wade wrote, Myself, taken by myself, in the following manner. First, I focused up for the table and chair. I then uncapped the lens, took up my position in the chair, kept still for two and a quarter minutes, and then replaced the cap. My watch was placed behind the frame with the kittens on and I gave an occasional glance at it. Chair of St Helen's Historical Society, Barbara Dyer, said, Is this the first selfie ever in 1911? What an amazing man Willie was. Thanks, Fred, so much. He thought the photo should come home to St Helen's. What a kind and generous man. The other photo shows the shed in his garden where Willie Wade did his developing. Memories of Nuclear Alert Test CP reader Andy Snook of London writes Reading we were ready for a nuclear war in White Memories took me back to the late 1970s when I lived in Areton. My dad was a police inspector on the island and we lived in what had been the police house in Areton. In the old police office at the front of the house was one of the loudspeaker units connected to the national warning system. Every so often a postcard would be delivered advising a test. You are instructed to turn the receiver on for the specified time when an announcement would be made giving a code word which you had to write on the postcard and return, presumably to confirm the system was working. I recall on one occasion my dad was working and asked me to listen for the announcement and fill out the card. This I duly did. To this day I remember the code was PINPOINT. I did wonder afterwards whether, if it had been a real alert, would I have been able in the four minutes available to get to the shed at the back of the house, remove my dad's tools and gardening equipment, get out the unopened, get out the unopened pa packing case in the corner of the shed containing the hand operating si siren, break open the packing case and then work out how to operate it all before the missile arrived. As to what I and the other inhabitants of Areton were to do when the siren went off, there were no instructions. And now we move on to white memories. Dangerous work on the home front. As the First World War commemor commemorations draw to an end, there is an aspect of the conflict which has been largely overlooked. The colossal lo loss of life inflicted on all sides had two causes weaponry and disease. At the start of the war, Gilbert Henry Attrell waved goodbye to his eldest brother, Frederick William Attrell. Fred volunteered in Ryde in September 1914 for Kitchener's Army. Six months later, Fred died of typhoid. So Gilbert, who was, known, who was in no hurry to join the war, he worked as an assistant for Adams Grocer's Shop in Moncton Street, Ride. In October 1915, he married Elizabeth, Lizzie, Wilshire, housemaid to Mr and Mrs Hobart of Burlington House, The Strand, Ride. The newlyweds moved to Gosport to house share with Lizzie's cousin, Neil, and husband, Ted Pomery. Ted was in the Royal Marines Light Infantry. Gilbert got work as a canteen assistant, possibly at Ted's Barracks in Gosport. 
Years before the war started, Gilbert's older brother, Sidney Charles Attrell, left his parents' home and joined the Royal Navy. During the First World War, Sid served on the destroyer HMS Firedrake. Portsmouth's fleet was powerless without weapons. The Ordnance de- Depot at Pretty's Hard, Gosport, kept the Navy, including HMS Firedrake, supplied with awesome ammunition. Armaments manufacture was no soft op- option. The work was dangerous. But by 1916, the government began aggressive conscription of all able-bodied men, single and married. Gilbert faced a choice, risk death while making weapons or risk death in the fighting forces. Now a father to baby Bert, Gilbert went into Pretty's Hard as an unskilled labourer. Continual supplies of weapons were vital, but the manufacture wasn't a reserved occupation for men. Some British de- depot men were conscripted into the army. Gilbert's exemption may have been due to his right eye. It turned inwards, a handicap to straight shooting. The working day at Pridis lasted from dawn to dusk, six days a week. In summer, this was from 5am to 9pm. The only lighting in the depot was natural daylight, so winter working hours were shorter. Shirking work wasn't tolerated. One pretty man was fined by a magistrate's court for poor work attendance. A lad was punished for reading a motorcycle magazine in the tailor's shop. He was sent to Parkhurst of Pretty's, of Pretty's Hard to practice shell filling, a boring, noisy, repetitive task. There's a high risk of explosion during weapon manufacture. All men and women workers were specially clothed or special clothing and footwear. Soft-soled shoes were designed to eliminate any sparks if scuffed on the minute traces of gunpowder on the ground. Floors were swept hourly to remove powder spills during the shell filling process. Thunderstorms posed a particular threat. A thunder bell hung outside the buildings. The bell was rung when thunder was heard 15 minutes distance away. This gave the workers time to evacuate their workplace. They removed their overalls, which might be contaminated with explosives, and stowed these in lockers. Then they ran to on-site air raid shelters in the depot until the electrical storm had passed. This safety measure was brought in after an explosion during a thunderstorm, which resulted in loss of life. Gilbert's exact duties aren't known, but typically male labourers did the heavy work. Men lifted the ammunition into metal shell boxes used to transport the weapons. The boxes were loaded onto a handcart and wheeled into storage sheds. From there, more labourers shifted the ammo onwards for transport across to the Navy moored in Portsmouth docks. Every step of the way accidental explosion could happen. The various types of ammo were painted in different identifying colours. The shell boxes were painted with the same colour code. Men did this printing job. Used boxes were salvaged. The old paint was scraped off and fresh paint applied. Women workers did much of the shell filling. They gained the unwanted nickname of canary girls because their skin turned yellow from handling the gunpowder. Some women died doing this dangerous job. In August 1918, Gilbert and Lizzie suffered the sad loss of their second son, Aubrey. He was six months old. Weeks later, the war ended. In the conflict, eight million servicemen died. 21 million were injured. Brothers Gilbert and Sid had survived the carnage. When Sid left the Navy, he returned to the family home in Mitchell's Road, Halen's Ride. For a while, Gilbert and his family remained in Gosport. In March 1919, he moved to a newer part of the Ordnance Depot called Bednam. His weekly wage increased from 24 shillings to 25 shillings. Bednam, further up Portsmouth Harbour, 
was the armament storage and loading depot. A narrow gauge train transported weapons from the stores onto a short pier. Men loaded the ammo onto small boats and sailed across the harbour. They unloaded the deadly cargo onto naval ships. This civilian job within the naval establishment may have been Gilbert's route into his next employment. King George called for Britain's merchant fleet to be rebuilt to regain the country's fortunes. Many former pretty men transferred into the merchant navy. Gilbert did this just weeks before the government announced 700 redundancies at the depot. By then, Lizzie had given birth to daughter Marjorie. A year later, Gilbert moved into the golden age of transatlantic liners. His merchant navy career is another story for another day. Priddy's Hard is now the Explosion Museum, part of Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. And my view, and this is Malcolm Mime. What happened to school promises? Education, education, education. Six months ago, the island elected a Conservative Council. One of the main reasons the Tories won the election was because leader Dave Stewart promised to get 13 of the 52, that's 25%, island schools to an Ofsted level of outstanding by 2021. With our pupils and teachers now back in the classroom for, new, for a new school year, and with 2021, just 29 months ago, this seems a good time for me to give an interim report on Dave's achievements so far. And as it is a school report, I shall give Dave a mark at the end. Since the Council's election of May 2017, there have been Ofsted inspections at 24 of our schools, so with Dave's pledge in mind, it is reasonable for us to expect six of those inspected would have received a rating of outstanding. Northwood Primary was the first school to be inspected after the election, and head teacher Sarah Hussey received a glowing report from Ofsted, who described her and her team as having a clear vision for a continually improving school with high aspirations for all pupils. The rating given was good, which, although very credible, would have been a disappointment to Dave, who would no doubt have had Northwood as one of his target schools. I mean, star target seats, I mean schools. The next two schools to be inspected, both rated as requires improvement which is the next level down from good. But the fourth school inspected under Dave Stewardship, or should that be Stewardship, I'll get my coat, brought some good news, with Newport CE Primary being upgraded as good from requires improvement, thanks in the main to the hard work of head teacher Catherine Marshall, who Ofsted described as having highly effective leadership. The next two reports to arrive on Mr Stewart's desk would probably resulted in him crawling underneath it to hide. The Sandown Bay Academy, Sandown Grammar stroke Sandown High in Old Money, report gave the school a rating of inadequate, while the report for the Isle of Wight College, which was one of the two pre-Tory outstanding schools, was downgraded to a, downgraded to a rating of good. The next three inspections all resulted in good ratings, with Lane's End, formerly Love Lane, in Cows, described as having gone from strength to strength, with head teacher Caroline Sice called a leader with clear vision for improving the school. High praise was also given to both the staff and head teacher Rachel Kitchell at Cows. Rachel Kitley at Cowes Enterprise, the former Cowes High, with the school going from special measures to good. Unfortunately, it wasn't such good news from either Carisbrook College, formerly Carisbrook High, or Medina College, 
Medina High, with both receiving ratings of requires improvement from their inspections carried out last November. The back end of last year also saw good ratings achieved by Yarmouth, Nine Acres and Gatton and Lake Primary Schools, which again is commendable. The first two inspections of 2018 didn't help Dave, with Carisbrook Primary School also getting a good instead of the outstanding Dave would have hoped for, while Oakfield Primary School, which these days is based on the old ride secondary modern stroke Bishop Lovett site, received a rating of requires improvement, down from its previous rating of good. The next two inspections brought encouraging results, with both Halens and St Thomas of Canterbury coming up from requires improvement to good, and there were also good ratings given to the primary schools at Bay, Chillerton and Rookley, St Helens and Binstead, plus a good for the Island Learning Centre at Newport. So, there we have it. Since coming to power, on the back of a pledge to increase the number of Island schools with a rating of outstanding, from 4% to 25%, Mr Stewart hasn't seen a single school receive an outstanding rating and, in fact, he has lost one of the two outstanding ratings we had before he came to power. Currently, just one school is at a level of outstanding, so as Dave has gone backwards, I can only give him a mark of E- minus for his education pledge, coupled with a must-improve. And now an article by Rebecca Roncoroni, entitled Beautiful Nature Show That's Free for All. We've recently moved into the countryside just on the edges of Carisbrook. Having been brought up on a farm in Merston and spending many happy days in Carisbrook with my grandparents, I've always wanted to return to the country. For a country girl, towns, estates, have always felt claustrophobic, cluttered and far too noisy. It's always made me smile when townies eulogise about how safe, how beautiful, how peaceful, how green the countryside is. Then the same people move to their bucolic daydream of a house in the country and the reality kicks in. They complain about cockerels crowing, Tractors going too slowly and jamming up country lanes. The mud, the isolation, the lack of shops, poor public transport and the inconvenience. Rural living is indeed very different, but for me, the pros far outweigh the cons. I'd forgotten how noisy the countryside is, especially when your garden backs onto a large pond with ducks and swans as well as the rookery and trees aside the pond. At dawn and dusk, the birdsong is nature's death metal, loud. There is one particular mouthy mallard who we've nicknamed Donald, <laughs> after Trump, not Duck, who quacks and shouts out at all hours of the day and night. The sights aren't bad either. The rooks and ducks flock first and last thing, playing around on the thermal currents together, having a great chat. When the ducks come back in to land, there seems to be a competition around who can crash land the loudest with the longest skid. Other water birds being dive-bombed shout their displeasure. The naughty mallards ignore them and sound as if they're laughing their heads off. We have a hen pheasant who comes into the garden a lot, she has two male admirers. One is very grand with full plumage and knows it. The other has somehow lost his tail feathers so looks a little tatty around the edges and has a mournful air. I love the fact he still hangs around, just in case. Every day we sit with our coffee, surrounded by green, breathing, fresh oxygen given by the trees, watching the life show nature provides for us every single moment of the day, and it soothes the soul like nothing else. There are many insects. Masses of spiders' webs appear every day in the garden. Many little things that bite. Beetles, ants, woodlice and ladybirds are everywhere. We have to help a dragonfly out of the sitting room. 
And then we have a little wren who flies into the, into the house, says hello, and then flies out again. We are so lucky on our island. It is truly one of the most beautiful places in the world. And all of this beauty, the beaches, the countryside and nature is free and available to all. We live in a very special place. It's good to be a country girl again. And some more news from this week's County Press. Brothers scale Ben Nevis. The Harrison brothers have been busy training for Kilimanjaro climbing next month by scaling Britain's tallest mountain. Robert, 69, Henry, 67, and Hugh, 66, who hope to raise £1,000 for Uzima in our hands, a Kenyan charity based on the Isle of Wight, reached the summit of Ben Nevis in three and a half hours. They started training in earnest in May by trekking up Mount Snowdon and have already raised £575 towards their target. Following last Saturday's climb, Hugh said, The three Harrisons ascended Ben Nevis in the mist, the rain and the cold, but it felt like a great achievement. The brothers were born in Kenya and lived there as children before leaving in 1957. When they climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, it will be the first time they have returned to the continent of their birth. Eldest brother Robert, a retired golf professional, now lives in Holland and Henry, a semi-retired architect, lives in London. Hugh, a semi-retired complementary therapist of Hillis Gate Road, Northwood, said, We aim to raise £1,000 to further the crucial, crucial work of Uzima in our hands in tackling poverty, poverty, ill health and lack of education, educational opportunities for the poorest of the poor in this area in Kenya. And that's the end for today. We wish you a good weekend. I'm saying goodbye from Linda. And goodbye from Leicester. This is the BBC. This is In Touch, the magazine programme for people like me who are blind or partially sighted. I'm Peter White. Thanks for downloading this week's edition. Good evening. Tonight, after the closure of a school for visually impaired children with additional health needs... What are the parents left searching for appropriate care and education for their children? And how to hold an audience in the palm of your hand? We join ex-servicemen who are losing their sight but gaining a new set of skills. First though, last week we learned about the closure of the RNIB Pairs Centre in Coventry after it failed to satisfy the education standards body Ofsted that it was able to safeguard its pupils adequately. Its chair, Eleanor Southwood, told us more about why they'd taken that decision to close. Over the past six months, staff and everybody involved has worked very, very hard on improvements to the centre. It has become clear to us, however, that we have not managed to achieve what the regulators require from us and we are not, therefore, the right people to be providing what is a very, very specialist nursing environment. But what happens now to a group of children who have special needs beyond their visual impairment? There are currently 15 children who live at the children's home and a further eight day pupils who attend the school. Well I've been talking to Hardeep Rai whose 11 year old son Ishan attends the school. Hardeep has taken a leading part in a parents' forum at the Pairs Centre. And he told me how he felt about the closure. Well, Ishan's been at Pairs for almost three years now. He moved in from December 2015. And initially, I'd been extremely happy that he'd found a home that I thought was going to be his home for the following 10 years. So I'm obviously very disappointed, shocked, 
angry, frustrated, and a whole load of other words in that in that vein about the closure of pairs. How sudden was it? Because of course you will have known about the Ofsted reports and the and the problems. Were you expecting the school to close? To be very honest, Peter, I've been a proactive parent over the last two to three years, so I've been aware of some of the challenges that pairs have been facing throughout that journey. I had hoped that it wouldn't come to this. Obviously, uh, we all worked very hard with the new management team to try and keep pairs open because we knew that they had challenges but we didn't think it was going to lead to this. Um, Just tell us a bit more about Ishan. So Ishan is 11 years old and he has cerebral palsy and he is on the severe end of the spectrum so he is visually impaired, he is not able to eat other than pureed food so he has some very extreme challenges, he needs one-on-one care however he is a very sweet, very kind, very caring, very loving little child who's very inspirational Um, and he doesn't really exhibit behavioural issues Um, but his care is intense and it is full-time. Just just give us perhaps a bit of a picture of the Pairs Centre because quite a lot of the children are resident there. Can you just explain how that worked and where they would live? There were five bungalows across the Pairs Centre and in each bungalow you have up to six children. Each child, they have their own room. They have a lovely lounge where they all interact and they have a quiet lounge where parents can go to sometimes. And the bathrooms had very large baths that would actually move up and down. You know, Ishan absolutely adores his baths. (laughs) And then you'd literally cross a road that was inside the same grounds and you would come into the school. And the school was fabulous. You know, it's a really big place. The classrooms are very well adapted. They have a superb hall. And then on top of that, they had parent quarters. So, you know, if we wanted to stay overnight, then they had bedrooms for parents. They had everything there. And, you know, for the children, they'd go to school. They'd come back to the bungalows for lunch. Then they'd go to school again. So you can see why that's going to be very hard to replicate. Absolutely. Now, the main reason the RNIB gave for closing uh, the Pairs Centre was their inability to satisfy Ofsted, that they were able to safeguard the pupils. Did you have concerns about how he was actually being looked after? Do you know, I think... The carers on the front line, I think, have worked painstakingly hard. I think there are exceptionally good people. And I was never really worried about Ishan's care and safety as such. I think the concerns I had around safeguarding were more around their processes and procedures and senior management. Well, well, explain what you mean by that. So I think that, you know, having, having seen Pairs over the last three years and watched it very closely, one of the reasons that we got Ishan into Pairs first was that it was Ofsted Outstanding. I think just before the year he went in but I think over the last two to three years I had seen a decline in management and the way that they interacted with the carers on the front line and that was a great concern to me and that was one of the reasons that I raised a lot of the concerns that I did over the period of time. And how would you describe the mood of the parents generally now? Very very angry very angry and I think that is the predominant feeling you know when I was walking around there just a few days ago you look at the facility Peter and it really is quite remarkable they have the best of everything in terms of you know the facilities for for all the children and I think a lot of us feel kind of it's almost like we don't believe what's happening we feel that you know it's really careless to have let an institution like this and a place like this to get it to the point that it's at it's it's really unfortunate and we all feel that way I mean it must feel like an enormous waste It does. And in fact, you know, this is one of the things I was just saying to some of the parents the other day. The amount of money that would have gone into this centre, even getting it built, it's tens of millions of pounds, Peter. So it's very unfortunate that it's in the position that it's in. So can you explain how how that has happened, given that, as you said, it had very good Ofsted reports four years ago? The honest truth, Peter, is I don't really know the ins and outs of what goes on behind the scenes in management. We'll never really know that as parents. I suppose we We can only go by what we see and some of the simple things that would go wrong were that they would use a lot of agency workers for instance and you know 
messages that were that should have been communicated to agency workers about Ishan, for instance, weren't. It's how Ishan's charts were recorded, you know, in terms of his seizures or different types of things and inconsistencies in the ways that those things were recorded. And I think that that would lead you to think that between the carers and the management or the registered care managers of old, you know, I think it would be fair to say that the, the new management team that came in over the last few months have had an extreme difficult time and I don't apportion a lot of blame to them so I'm talking about of old Mm. you know those I think are where some of the challenges have lied so were they given long enough then this new team you know from a parent point of view not really I think it would have been nice if they were given a you know another three to six months and they could have really turned things around so what happens to Ishan now Well, Ishan is now in a a very challenging situation. We have seen two schools. We have another two schools that we're going to see. And of course, the biggest issue is you can't compare the facility. And that's the number one thing that we notice. Wherever we've been to, whatever we've seen, the facility itself is nothing like R&IB pairs. But what we have to try and do is look past that now and look at the people, the teachers, um, the processes, the methods, the expertise they have on site. There are so many things that we've learned over the last two to three years that we now need to sort of apply in the way that we question these new schools. So how difficult will it be for Ishan with with this change, with a change of school? You know, the beauty of Ishan is he's had so much change in his life. He's become a very adaptable child. Having said that, over the last three years, he's worked very closely with a number of carers that have been excellent with him. And I think this move will be very challenging for him. I don't think it's going to be easy at all. And I think we're going to have to really sort of hold his hand and make sure that the familiar voices that he's used to are around him during this transition period. And what about other parents? They're in similar positions. I think the fantastic thing about the parents now is that we're sharing a lot of information and you know I tell them about schools that I've seen and they tell me about schools they've seen and we're sort of learning from each other and that is one very good thing that's come out of this. The RNIB said very openly on on the programme last week that they felt now that they aren't the right people to be running a school like this with those complex nursing needs. Do you agree with that? I think when I first came into this place, I thought they were the right people because they had done well historically. But I think having seen what I've seen, I think it's not so much the RNIB were not the right people. I think the people that were in management positions may not have been the right people. So actually, I would say the RNIB probably did have the skill set. I think as the carers on the front line certainly had the skill sets. I mean, you always get the odd individuals that may not sort of come up to scratch, but the majority of them did. And so to me, I put it down to not having the right management in place, actually. Hardy Rai. We asked the RNIB about the future of the site. They told us they had considered a number of options, including finding a new provider to run the centre. Unfortunately, they weren't able to actually do this in the time they had available, so they've decided that the best option is to close the centre. They say the property will be put on the market. And many of you wanted to add your thoughts to the wider-ranging interview that we did with the RNIB about its current problems. Jim Moran from Liverpool was unhappy with what he heard. Such a pity that after more than six months to get their act together, that the RNIB acting CEO and chair were unable to answer many questions asked by Peter. No mention of working with partners within the visual impairment sector, but still clinging on to ideas of providing local services such as eye clinic liaison officers, which they are unable, because of the geography of the UK, to do effectively. We can't afford duplications of services. My only hope is that they can recruit a CEO with the vision and energy to help its out-of-touch trustees face the fact of what they are good at and what they are not. Stephen Bremner thought they had to make choices too, although different ones from those of Jim. Is it time for the RNIB to become more local and less national? There are many areas in the UK that suffer from poor representation and it can be frustrating to see the county next door with great organisations and one's own county with an almost non-existent body for blind and partially sighted people. Gail Guest worried about where the cuts were likely to fall. She and her husband volunteer with Talk and Support, which helps older visually impaired people get together to chat through their problems. 
From our experience, we know how important this service is to the clients who use it. We feel that the changes which are having to be made will worry some clients a great deal. We know that the talk and support staff are working extremely hard to make the change as easy as possible for users. But as many are elderly and some vulnerable, it will be very difficult for them. This service is important for getting people out of isolation, so it should not be affected by these cuts. And some of you were concerned by the extent to which visually impaired people are actually involved in the running of the organisation. Darren Williams emailed, I really cannot believe the interim CEO did not know how many visually impaired people had been made redundant. And James Bird thinks I should have put another question to the chief executive. If RNIB is an organisation of blind people, then shouldn't a minimum 51% of the staff be blind or partially sighted? Do keep your comments coming. You can call our action line for 24 hours after the programme on 0800 044 044, email in touch at bbc.co.uk or click on contact us on our website from where you can also download tonight's and previous editions of the programme. Now, last Saturday night, I got up to deliver an after-dinner speech. I've done quite a lot of these now. It tends to go with the job. But even now, I still get that little flutter of butterflies before I start. Will tonight be the night when I dry up? And of course, there are some people for whom getting up in front of an audience is their biggest possible nightmare. Well, now Blind Veterans UK, the organisation for servicemen and women who are now blind or partially sighted, is offering public speaking courses. They see it as a way of increasing confidence, adding a skill in the jobs market and there's a bit of self-interest too. They like their members to go out and sell the organisation from time to time. Our reporter Tom Walker has just been to Landidno to listen and learn. Good morning gentlemen. What I would like you to do please is just when I ask you to do so if you can just stand up where you are and introduce yourselves to the group. Good morning, Uh, my name is Alan Locke, ex-Navy man myself. I've been with the charity for about 15 years. I'm a former officer in the Royal Navy. I joined from university to serve as a submarine engineer and I began losing my sight fairly early in my career at the age of 24. And uh, yeah, that was a very life-changing event, as you can imagine, for me. Now, Alan Locke, we would like to hear from you. We would like to hear a little bit about your favourite walk that you've had here in Britain. This is Rowan Webb as Toastmaster introducing fellow trainee Alan Locke as Alan was about to give a spontaneous talk lasting 90 seconds. It's a town called Clevedon in Somerset. And if I can just describe to you what it's like to to approach what I think is the most beautiful stretch of the coastline, always terrific to go there at dawn. So the sun is coming up. You can feel the rays of the heat on your skin. As you approach the seafront, you can hear the the waves crashing and and lapping over the stones. It's a a shingle beach, so you can hear that distinctive. Thank you very much there, Alan Locke. Thank you for your time there. I knew I I wasn't the finished article by any means coming in here, but learning about some of the the small kind of tweaks to your your style for me in particular, maybe it's the posture and yeah, just a lot of good habits I guess about how you structure the speech and and finally I suppose just we've been thrown into scenarios where you you virtually had to think on your feet, and I come away from that thinking well, actually yeah I can. I can string together something which is vaguely coherent and it's great going forward. So I'd love to build on what we've learned during these last few days. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Only last Saturday, I visited Cardiff on a day's trip with family and friends. It's quite a busy bustle. My name's John Robinson. I served 12 years in the parachute regiment, jumping out of planes and everything else. Back in 2008, I ended up getting macular degeneration in both my eyes. You've been fully sighted, so you obviously know what that feels like, and you're now visually impaired. Would it be easier for you, as a fully sighted person, to to do this course, do you think? Um, No, not at all, no, because... You're not really using your eyes. It's giving you the confidence to speak and to be fluent and, and sort of like crystal clear, really. So let's have a look at this whole thing around body language in public speaking. And what I've been encouraging all of you today so far is to be standing up straight with your, your shoulders down and, and to face the world. 
to look at the world. And if you forget everything else about the training, when you go out after today, remember that though. What will happen is if you develop a strong posture, grounded posture, it will really infect the rest of you so that your narrative becomes much more confident, your delivery will become more confident, it has, it has a powerful ripple effect to it. Getting your body language right is critical for being an effective public speaker, according to course trainer Kim Crosby. Kim says that the blind veterans have exactly the same issues as other people she comes across. What I do tend to find is that people can be hugely unconfident and that manifests itself in its body language where they do shrink in front of an audience and I need to, to encourage them. The people that I come across generally tend to have, they need their confidence boosted and they need to be encouraged and one way to do that is to en encourage them to stand up tall and proud, to address the world, to not feel shy about who they are, to celebrate who they are. Facial expressions are part of body language as well. So the example that I gave you earlier in the training course was maybe about a news presenter on TV where if they were commentating on a, a, on a wedding, for example, a royal wedding, they may, might have a smile playing on their lips. Conversely, if they're talking about something serious like commemorations at the Remembrance Day parade in November, they would do that in more reverential tones and their body language, <coughs> their face, definitely wouldn't have a smile on it. Another thing for Rowan to think about and for others to think about too, what you might want to consider is plopping in a quotation. Confidence, confidence. So, yeah. I was the kind of person before that I kind of pretended to be confident when maybe I wasn't just to give the facade that everything is okay. Well, certainly during this course I don't need to do that because I feel confident genuinely. Are there any wider applications of what you've learned from this course? I generally found that I wouldn't necessarily go out and do things with some of my friends if it was in an evening, whereas uh, since I've been involved with blind veterans and doing courses such as the one that I'm doing today, it gives you a level of confidence to at least attempt these. Yes, there are going to be hiccups, there's going to be situations that are difficult to deal with, but you're in an environment where you have friends that will teach you how to deal with those. That report by Tom Walker. Reactions, please. Maybe your own public speaking tips. And that's it for today. From me, Peter White, producer Jess Quayle and the team, goodbye.